Well, for a believer, no failures are permanent. Isn't that a blessing? Have you thought about that? For lost people, failures are permanent. They never go away. They stay with you forever. But for us who are forgiven, the Lord offers us the reality that he is the God of new beginnings and the second chance. I want you to open to the second book of the New Testament, okay? What would you call the second book of the New Testament? The Gospel by whom? Mark, that's right. When you turn there, you're turning to one of the most powerful examples of what God does with someone we would call a failure. Someone who quit. Someone who left behind their calling, abandoned it. And God used him so greatly that he is the second gospel writer in the New Testament we hold. As you turn there, we're looking at the Gospels. Remember, we're, we're beginning right now uh, through the Gospel by Mark. We're going to be in it for probably many weeks and months ahead. And I want to give you this week and next kind of an overview. Uh, this week, the man that it's named after is called the Gospel by Mark. The Gospels, there are four of them, are perfect portraits of Jesus Christ. They're snapshots of Jesus Christ. Matthew is a portrait of Christ as the perfect king. And in the book of Matthew, everything about it revolves around the kingship of Christ, his his genealogy and and his birth like no other king announced from heaven and on earth. His life, he lived the the perfect life, uh, showing what justice and equity are all about. And then his death, he died as no one ever died, a perfect death. Isn't that the blessing of salvation, that someday we aren't going to have a balance due when we get to heaven, but Jesus for those who come simply by faith to him, paid it all. And that's what Matthew is, the perfect king. Mark, which we're going to study this morning, shows Jesus as the perfect servant. In fact, all the way through this book, we'll see he's always doing and serving. And and the theme of the book is the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give. And so the perfect servant. Luke is a snapshot of Jesus as the perfect man. And God used a doctor to look at Jesus Christ, and he looked at the intricacies of his coming and and sees the virgin birth. He looks at, at Jesus Christ perfect growing up, and it looks at medical difficulties of people around. Luke was pointing out everybody's medical and even describes them all medically. And in the midst of that is a perfect man in a world of fallen men. And then John shows Jesus as the perfect deity or the perfect God in a world of false gods, of feeble gods, of of charlatans. John presents the true and living God. But I said Mark is about the perfect servant. I want you to think about something for a minute this morning. God has many servants in this world. He's used many people throughout the centuries within the body of Christ and in the old economy, in the old covenant. But there's only been one perfect servant God has ever had, and that was his son, Jesus Christ. Everyone else is imperfect. And often people wait to jump in to serve the Lord until they can do it perfectly. I'll tell you what, if you wait till you can serve God perfectly, you'll never do it. Because we are imperfect, we are frail, we are fallen, we are feeble, we are sinners. The older I get, the more painfully I'm aware of my shortcomings, my failures, and the more painfully I'm aware of my own sinfulness. And if I waited till I could do something perfectly, I would never do it, and neither would you. And Mark is an example of someone who served the Lord and failed, and the Lord restored him and used him in such a greater way, because failures for believers are not permanent. And that's very comforting for me. And that's the testimony of this book. In fact, in my Bible, as I look on the second gospel, the biggest word on the page, I don't know about your Bible, but on my Bible, it's the word Mark. And I want you to think about Mark with me this morning because this book involves his testimony. This book is the clearest picture I know in all of God's word of what God can do with a failure. As we open this book and begin studying it in the days ahead, we're opening to the words of Mark. Inspired by God, but they're the words of Mark, but he's capturing the experiences of Peter. In fact, the, almost the, the voice of church history past is almost universal in declaring that Mark was the servant that took care of Peter in his last days and captured Peter's experiences on paper under the oversight of the Holy Spirit to produce the gospel 
the second gospel, the gospel by Mark. So we're going to see actually two different lives reflected in this book. This morning we're going to examine the human writer of this gospel, which is Mark, and next, ma- next week the man behind the gospel, a man called Peter. And this is truly his experience coming out on paper. But what's amazing, as, as I even talk about this, is we're talking about the only book that God wrote. Remember, God wrote one book. In fact, the Psalms tell us that forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So there, there is a special elite group of people that God picked to work with throughout the centuries. We have the pre-flood patriarchs, and we have the post-flood patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then we have the prophets, and then we have the apostles, But there's one very distinct group of individuals, 40 of them, that wrote books of the book of books. What a very special honor. And to think that God chose such a special servant to communicate this book. And what's amazing is that there's one name linked with one of those books of the Bible that's forever settled in heaven, one of those 66 books from the book of books, and that name is the name Mark. And and as long as believers are on this earth, and as long as there are spirit-indwelt individuals seeking God through this book, they are going to come across the second of the Gospels. And it's always going to be the Gospel by Mark. And yet Mark, by every estimation, was a dropout. He was a man who had an incredible beginning, who had everything going for him, and he quit. He was a man who was given one of the greatest opportunities in the early church in the ancient world, and he failed. And yet God is the God of the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth chance. And one of the greatest testimonies of God's grace is that that name is in front of you on that page this morning. Let me show you what I mean as we open God's word to chapter 12 of the book of Acts. The only way to understand Mark is to turn to Acts. So now you're in Mark. Go to the right. And it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then get with me to chapter 12 of the book of Acts. And that's going to be the text we're going to read this morning to kind of begin our our biographical look at this man. Because Mark, the dropout, the quitter, and the failure, to best understand this man is to see him in the context of when God called him and chose him to do a great work for him. Verse 24, we're going to start in Acts 12, and I'll read with you 24 and 25. But the word of the Lord, verse 24, grew and multiplied. Now look at verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And look at this. They also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now there he is. That's the man we're looking at that wrote the second gospel. And let's look into his life. Bow with me. Father in heaven, I pray that you, in a very special way, empower our hearts to concentrate and focus upon a thought. The thought of who you used to write this great gospel. And the fact that he was ordinary, he was a young man, he was a failure. But he is a portrait of your grace, as all of us are. And all of us can achieve great things for your glory, if we will but go on. Go on allowing you to forgive us. Go on allowing you to take our weaknesses and our failures and make them portraits of your grace. Oh, Father, I pray that Mark's life would encourage us to jump into service for you, to serve you even if we are weak, to serve you even if we're afraid, even if we're troubled and turned back at times. May we experience the incredible grace that you offered, Mark, and that you offer to us today. In the name of Jesus, we ask that. Amen. Look at chapter 13 now. That's where we're building up to. Verse 1 of chapter 13 is what we call in the Bible the first missionary journey. Now, those words aren't in the text, but that's usually uh, what, what is cataloged, especially if you have a study Bible. And I want to read through it with you. It says, The church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, that we'll learn in a few moments, is John Mark's uncle. Okay, this guy's the guy that wrote the Gospel by Mark is quite well known in the New Testament world. His uncle is right there, 
Barnabas, uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Maon, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. This is where uh, the Apostle Paul had shown up. He had, he had grown up in Tarsus. He had shown up in Jerusalem. He had been befriended by Barnabas, taken to Antioch, and actually worked together as a team with this group of teachers and prophets in Antioch. That is what's going on. It must have been a glow in John Mark's eyes as he was in that early church. As he was asked by his uncle Barnabas to take a long journey up the coast and to the huge ancient Roman city of Antioch. Why, the word was out that, that one of the greatest movings of God since Pentecost was unleashed in, in Antioch. In fact, we know from the scriptures that Christians were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. It had become the epicenter of the early church. And here, at that epicenter of God's mighty work in Antioch, that huge Roman city, we find the thriving new center of Christianity. Now, remember, the Lord said, you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts. Well, Jerusalem had been a witness, and then the persecution had come in Acts chapter 8, and the Christians had spilled out into Judea and into Samaria, and then had begun to migrate out to the furthest reaches of the empire. And that's what is going on in Antioch. Antioch became the first sending missionary church of the New Testament era. A wonderful testimony. And from there, evangelists, prophets, and now missionaries are raised up. The new wave of the future, missionaries sent out from this mother church of Antioch to far-off places. They were supported by the body of Christ in Antioch. And John Mark was brought from Jerusalem by his uncle Barnabas and by that, that upcoming great servant, Saul, and was taken to be groomed to leave on the first missionary journey. I mean, I can just see his eyes sparkling. But this was only another of a great string of great honors for him. John Mark had been personally led to Christ by no less than the Apostle Peter. You say, how do you know that? First Peter 5.13. Peter, at the end of his life, says, My beloved son, Mark. Now, Paul called Timothy his son, and we realize that's because he had been saved through Paul's ministry. And so we see that Peter also had a young man that was saved through his ministry that was very special to him. And that's who John Mark was. Now, you talk about having a pedigree. I mean, to be personally led to faith by the greatest of all the early apostles, there was an honor. But that wasn't all. The scriptures go on to say in Colossians 4.10 that Barnabas was John Mark's uncle. So... This early encourager that so blessed the church in Acts chapter 4, that that was a a towering discipleship leader. In fact, when they heard that people need to be discipled in Antioch, they sent their greatest discipler, his name was Barnabas, up there to, to be involved in that work. And he had a nephew who'd been led to faith by Peter, who had been personally trained in discipleship by the earliest and greatest of the discipleship leaders, Barnabas. But look back at chapter 12 of Acts in verse 12. I want to show you something else. It says, so when you consider this, he came to the house of Mary, Acts 12, 12. The mother of John, whose surname was Mark, here's that guy again, we're looking at, where many were gathered together praying. Guess what? John Mark grew up in the home of Mary, who was a relative of Barnabas where the early church used to meet. And you know what it says there? A great many. This was one of the early huge homes of Jerusalem. So obviously John Mark was from wealth of some kind. His uncle Barnabas owned property on an island and lived in Antioch and had a home. And, you know, I mean, so there was some kind of wealth involved here. There was some kind of large, expansive home where the early church met. In fact, as soon as Peter was released from prison by the angel, he went right to John Mark's house. So that means he knew the place. He frequented it. And a whole galaxy, probably, of the early church saints passed through John Mark's home. Can you imagine living at home and having Billy Graham come for lunch and, you know, Bill Bright stop for supper and have Hudson Taylor and C.T. Studd and all the other greats just kind of coming through? That's what it was like in the first century. The scripture writers, the apostles, and the greatest saints were meeting and leading meetings in his home. He had a pretty good start. And now, in verse 2, 
as he ministered, chapter 13, verse 2, to the Lord, as they, this whole group, ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to. And having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. And guess what? They were the called and commissioned ones, Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas was first. He was the leader. And because he was the leader, Barnabas said, John Mark, you who are led to faith by Peter, you know the Lord. You who I personally discipled and nurtured, you who have seen so much of the work of God in Jerusalem, I want you to come with us. As we, for the first time, penetrate the heart of the Roman Empire, they were going to go on a trip to the very center of the thriving province what is modern-day Turkey, which has more Roman ruins than, than Italy itself, has more Greek temples than Greece has, it has more Christian sites than the Holy Land. Today, it was the thriving center of the Roman Empire. And Paul and Barnabas said, if we shoot right up to the center of that thriving province and people get saved, they'll take the light of the gospel to the furthest ends of the earth. Do you want to come with us? And John Mark said, I want to go. And he was so excited. His eyes were still glowing. He goes to walk and talk and sleep and eat and share every day with Paul and Barnabas. I can't imagine what the discussions were like over every meal. As Paul spoke from his personal mastery of the Old Testament, he said that he had mastered the scriptures. You know what that meant in Jewish terms? He had memorized the Old Testament. That means when he sat to the meal, he didn't have to grab a Bible. He'd just say, let's have a reading from Isaiah, and he'd quote it. And then he would comment on it because he was a teacher among the Jews. I mean, that was like going off to Bible college. Can you imagine walking and sitting on a boat and traveling on the ancient Roman roads with Paul beside you explaining the scriptures? And beyond that, there was the cultural commentary. The Apostle Paul not only knew the Old Testament, he had mastered the literature of his day. And so as they were walking and he'd see some towering Greek temple or some Roman pantheon or or even some other pagan idol along or, or altar on the roadside. He would discuss and describe and demonstrate what God's word said about that. So it was like John Mark went off to seminary. And what a time he had. If you continue reading, it says they set out, went to Seleucia, verse 4, and from there they got to go on a cruise. I mean, this was really great. He's on a cruise now, and he's taking off on a cruise to Cyprus, and that's where his uncle is from. And his uncle owned property there. I'm sure his eyes were just getting bigger and bigger as he was on this trip, afraid of nothing between these two towering giants. And then when they get to Cyprus, they get to Salamis, verse 5, and the word of God is preached. And John, it says in verse 5, was their assistant. So he was right there in the the center of all that God was doing. And when they went to Paphos, they found a sorcerer. And I'm sure he probably stood a little bit behind big, tall Barnabas and Paul, wondering what was going to happen next. Is this occultic figure, this this demon medium, this this witch, was, was confronting them because this Elemis, the sorcerer, had begun to influence the Roman provincial governor named Sergius Paulus. And he had gotten his his, uh, claws into this guy's mind and was starting to influence the direction of that province. So what does Paul do? Verse 8, Elymas the sorcerer, for his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So Saul, who is called Paul, verse 9, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of deceit and all fraud, son of the devil. I mean, a real, you know, how to win friends and influence people. Can you imagine you're in front of the Roman governor and this guy's standing there and you said, you're a son of the devil, an enemy of all righteousness. You pervert the straight ways of the Lord. Will you not cease? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And look at this. I'm sure by now John Mark's eyes are this big. And you talk about, this is first-hand missions. Can you imagine? You know, I've heard of the power team, you know. You know, they go around and break boards. Paul just, you know, he breaks people. And he just looks straight at him intently. And immediately, a dark mist fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to lead him. And verse 12, the proconsul believed. Wow. Now, John Mark had seen... An exciting boat ride to Cyprus, and then he witnessed firsthand the power of God. Paul confronts a satanic medium. He blinds him. He leads to faith the Roman governor of that province. Wow. 
And now, the next step, look at verse 13. After they got done, however long it took, to disciple, and probably Barnabas knew other people that could help this governor get going, this proconsul, Paul and his party set sail from Paphos. You know, it's a little subtle change. It goes from Barnabas and Saul to Paul and his party. Yeah, the real leader takes forth here, and Paul starts leading this thing. And they are going to go to Perga in Pamphylia. And Perga, if you know anything about ancient geography, was right at the beginning of one of the great marvels of the ancient world. It was the superhighway that cut through the Sicilian gates and went up to the upper plateau of Central Asia Minor, where there were just countless thousands of people scattered in ultra-modern cities along all the Roman roads. And Paul had his eyes set on getting to the heart of the Roman Empire. And so in Perga, they settled for a little while, and we're going to start going up that Roman road across a bridge that is still there today, that buses still go over. It's a 2,000-year-old massive Roman bridge. And just before they got there, look at the end of verse 13. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. You know, that's a very little blip. You might miss it if you don't catch it. He quit. The assistant. Now look, he is the assistant back in verse 5. In verse 13, he quits. I mean, he had been walking between the giants. He'd been experiencing firsthand the power of God. I mean, he was led to the Lord by Peter. He was discipled by his uncle. He'd seen every famous person in Christendom in Jerusalem. And he quit. And he went home. Literally, he went back to Mama. He missed one of the greatest sermons of all times when Paul preaches and when scores of people, the results are staggering in verse uh, 13, or 14 on. The, the most crucial event since Pentecost, the gospel cutting a path across the Roman roads to lighten dark pagan cities. Countless people were born again. The church blossoms across the empire. And Mark missed it all. He quit. He went home to his mother. That isn't even the end of it. Look at chapter 15. It has ramifications. Chapter 15, verse 36. uh, John Mark's choice splits the greatest evangelistic team of all history. Uh, Verse 36, after some days, after the huge success of the first journey, Paul says to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord. Let's see how they're doing. In verse 37, Barnabas was determined to take John, called Mark. But 38, Paul insisted that they should not take, look, listen to this, the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia. You know, there's one thing about Paul. If he believed something, you knew about it. He talked about it all the time. And they had come home, and they had given their report, and he had made it known that that guy had quit the work. And he declares it and lets people know that John Mark failed him, failed the work of Christ. And Barnabas said, But you know what? I'm a discipler. I'm an encourager. I come alongside. I want to come alongside him. He can make it. And look what happens. Verse 39, the contention. It became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. He took him back to that island he was from. Took him back to where the revival had begun. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. Sad chapter in church history, but when word of the split of Paul and Barnabas got around, it wasn't Paul or Barnabas that got the heat. It was surely Mark. Branded by all who would ever know him as Mark the quitter, the fearful, and the failure. Now, real quickly, go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. That's our last verse. If you turn there, you go all the way through the New Testament, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. There it is, 1st Peter, chapter 5, and the last chapter, verse 13 of chapter 5. Look at this. Fast forward with me. Twenty years have passed. And according to the nearly unanimous voice of scholarship over the centuries, now it's John Mark who has become the personal helper to Peter. Much like Luke would do to Paul, John Mark helps the aged Peter. And as Mark sat to capture Peter's words, look what Peter says in verse 13. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. 
Mark had gotten back to the one who led him to Christ, probably Barnabas sent him that way, and Mark becomes the servant, the one who accompanied Peter to the end, and the one who captures those words of Peter, those beautiful, unforgettable portraits, the snapshots of Christ. By the way, where was Peter? At the end of his life, we know that Nero captures him. He was serving in Mesopotamia, modern Iraq. Peter went to the Jews. There were more Jews living there than any other place because of the dispersion. And so over in old Babylon, Peter had gone. That's where the Babylonian Talmud was, and that's where all the the synagogues were. And so Peter had gone there, and his attention had been gotten by the emperor of what he was doing. He was arrested and taken to Rome. And who comes with him? John Mark. And there, as the church was suffering, as Nero was dipping believers tied to sticks in tar and turning them and using them as torches to light the imperial gardens, John Mark isn't a quitter anymore. As he sits next to the most wanted man in the empire, he's not a failure. He's not afraid anymore. As he sits there and records the words of Peter, remembering Christ, he doesn't fail. What happened to him? Well, I think that he experienced the grace of God. And when I think of the Gospel by Mark, I think of some truths that you can take home with you today. The first one is, when I see the Gospel by Mark, I realize that God wants to use ordinary people. Mark, I can relate to. Mark was afraid. Mark was unsure. Mark was hesitant. Mark bit off more than he could chew. Mark was running with the big leagues and wasn't ready for it. And Mark quit. And Mark went home to his mama. And God is the God who uses ordinary people. With ordinary fears and ordinary problems. And people that are just the kind of people like us. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26, You see your calling, brethren. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God, verse 27, has chosen the foolish things. God has chosen the weak things. God uses ordinary weak people, like Mark, who wrote the second book of the New Testament. Secondly, God wants to use those we would call failures. Before Mark wrote the gospel, he was a dropout from ministry. Paul was so upset, he he lost his best partner to take someone that he thought was a quitter. He would rather lose Barnabas than take a quitter. That's a failure. That's someone we would call a failure. But guess who John Mark ends up sitting next to at the end of his life? Someone we would also call a failure. Who most publicly in all the scriptures, denies Jesus Christ. Peter, do you see the affinity to Mark? He says, hey, I know, I kind of went through the same thing. And you know what? God's grace is sufficient. Because I failed him, and he restored me. You failed him, he'll restore you. You see, God loves to restore and use those who will humble themselves and come to him. Third thing I see is Mark was a young person, and God wants to use young people in ministry. Peter was young when the Lord called him. He saw that same ability in his youth. You know, it says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come, when you don't have any pleasure in them, before you get old and and everything's too complicated. Remember to serve the Lord. The Lord wants to use young people in ministry. And when the Lord moved on Paul's heart and Barnabas' heart to invite young John Mark on that first journey, God knew he would quit. But the Lord also knew that he wanted to make him a trophy of his mercy. And that's really the, the blessing. God wants to use the weaknesses in our lives to show his grace. The book of Acts, yes, tells us, John Mark, he was not useful at one time in ministry. But have you thought about the graciousness of our God? Every time we read this book, we are experiencing the result of God's transforming grace. Why? Because of the gospel by Mark. Here's his biography. Mark, the failed follower of Christ, becomes Mark, the forgiven follower of Christ, becomes Mark, the devoted disciple of Christ, becomes Mark, who writes what will be called the premier biography of Jesus Christ, who finally becomes Mark, the honored martyr of Jesus Christ. He hung around Paul or Peter too long in Rome. 
He wrote a gospel too closely associated with the most wanted man in the Roman Empire. And after Nero executed Peter, it wasn't too many years before the Roman Empire began hunting Mark down. And they chased him like a criminal and pursued him like an animal on a hunt until finally they found him and savagely killed him. He didn't quit. He didn't flee. He didn't give up. He was faithful to the end because God uses ordinary people. God uses people we might call failures. God calls young people. And God makes them portraits of his grace. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. And every time we go to the Gospel by Mark in the months ahead, don't ever forget who Mark was.